Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about smarter defensive driving, skills and abilities and techniques that you need to put in place to become a safer, smarter driver. And today we're going to give you those skills, abilities and techniques so that you can significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Corey is here. Corey is the moderator, does an excellent job of getting up the videos I suggest you have a look at uh, for the questions you ask and as well does an excellent job of keeping out the bad people. Uh, elevator fan tuning in from Monticello, Indiana. If you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know what class of license you're going for. Uh, we're doing the live stream tonight on Monday as opposed to Tuesday because... I got a bunch of things I got to do tomorrow and unfortunately I can't be here at the time of the live stream so we're doing it tonight and we're giving you skills and abilities to be a smarter safer driver significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash especially for those of us in the northern hemisphere right now and of course test 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 things are not going well <laughs> Just well, bear with me one sec. I know that the mag microphone's not working. Um, test, 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 test. Okay, so it looks like the microphone is working. <laughs> I get a little afraid there. Uh, retired is here. How are you? And uh, Elevator fan, congratulations to your parents on their anniversary. Uh, yes, defensive driving. I was having some technical issues because... Uh, had some issues getting the camera hooked up. One of those days. Some days you just sit down uh, to the live stream and everything is working. And there's other days you sit down to the live stream and nothing is working. You have to reconnect the camera, reconnect the microphone, everything else. So, uh, Corey says the audio is good. Thanks, Corey. Uh, elevator fan, I saw two left turn lane squatters on the interstate today. One of them was a big truck. Yes, and they're going to do that. I don't know what it is. People get out there. Velocitization, which is... They get kind of lulled into a sense of, uh, you know, Jedi mind trance while they're out on the highway, and uh, they forget to get back out of that out of that lane. <clears throat> uh, road test is tomorrow. Any uh, tips for first time, never driven before? Uh, ho hopefully, if you're doing your road test, you have driven before. Uh, I'm thinking what you're saying is is that you haven't done your driver's test yet. Okay. Uh, retired. I just brought bought uh, four new tires after putting 55,000 miles on my original tires. Good purchase. Awesome. And retired. I think we were talking about that a few weeks ago, a couple, two, three weeks ago, about where to pick up tires. Where did you end up getting your tires from? Uh, 55,000 miles. That's a good. Uh, that's a good uh, length of time for a set of tires. So you're doing well there. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. So tips for driver's test. You need four components in place to pass your driver's test. The way that everybody else drives on the road is what is termed social driving. They don't come to a complete stop at stop sign intersections. They speed. They follow too close. Those are just some of the major characteristics of social driving. And if you drive the way that everybody else drives on the roadway, you will not pass your driver's test. So the four components that you need in place, space management, observation, communication, and speed management. Speed management is down at the bottom. Space management is the most important, okay? Because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. And if you're far enough back and create that space in front of your vehicle, that three to four second following distance, you're going to be able to read traffic patterns and interpret the actions of individual road users. That's what you need to do. That is the most important thing for uh, test day. All right, and Corey's put up the playlist for final days. Thank you for that, Corey. Uh, space management, observation. You need to have a forward scanning pattern far down the road. In, look at your instrument panel. Far down the road, center mirror, far down the road, and then each wing mirror. Okay, and repeating that every 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, your scanning pattern is tied into your speed control. So if you're not adjusting your speed every 10 to 15 seconds, it tells the examiner that you are not scanning correctly because those two things are linked. They work in tandem. All right, uh, changing lanes, shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. I cannot stress shoulder checking enough. If you don't know how to shoulder check, Corey will put up the video for you on shoulder checking. All right, space management, uh, observation, uh, 360 degree scan around the vehicle before reversing for parking. Okay, out through the back window, you can look at a backup camera, you can look at your mirrors, but you can't use them as your primary line of sight. Communication, okay, 
What I'm going to talk about today in terms of smarter defensive driving, you need to have a backup. Okay, we're going to observe, we're going to look, but there's lots of people who believe that if there's nobody else around, they don't have to signal. They don't have to communicate with other traffic. So if we miss something, we want to have a backup. So we're going to communicate effectively. The five ways that we communicate with other traffic, the position of our vehicle on the roadway or the, where the road user is on the roadway, lights and signals, hand gestures, eye contact, and lastly, the horn. In North America, the horn is seen as a sign of aggression, so use it sparingly. I mean, if you're on a residential street and there's some kids running down the road or whatnot, then yeah, a light tap on your, on your horn, or somebody's looking at their phone, sitting at the traffic light and they're not going, then yeah, light tap on your phone, or on your horn, rather not your phone, that's not gonna do you any good, uh, your horn to tell them that they need to get going. And then last is speed control, okay? Posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Those are the four components. Space, space management, observation, communication, and speed management. That's what you need in place to pass your driver's test. Francesca, how are, how are you, my friend? Mr. Deverfield, uh, defensive driving, I prefer dr offensive driving. It's like defensive driving, but uh, with more profanity. Yes, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who do that. I know that I engage in that profane use of language while I'm driving. Uh, Ross and hey Rick, I passed my driving test on Friday with a perfect score in Ohio, and that is awesome news. Ross, and thank you so much for dropping back and letting us know, and I know that you have done the work. Luck favors the prepared, so congratulations on all your hard work and passing first time. Uh, Jason, I'm currently working on getting my driver's license now. Awesome. Uh, do you have your learner's license, Jason? Is that where you're at? Uh, retired, purchase tires at trusted local tire shop. Awesome. And the thing that I like about tire shops retire, uh, retired is that free tire rotations and as well, uh, usually free puncture repair. The last time I went to a tire shop and I found out why, because they sold the tire shop, uh, they started charging $4 for a repair on a tire, which is not cool because the more reputable tire shops, if you purchase the tires at that shop, and you get a puncture in the tire and take it back, they will fix it for free. So this is one of the reasons why I always like taking it to a local tire shop, as you just said. Free tire rotations and free uh, puncture repair on your tires that you purchased at that shop. Deverfield, awesome. Uh, Elvin, I need an example about how to do the pullover. Uh, Elvin, which pullover? Are you talking about the emergency pullover in Ontario? Is that the one you're talking about? Elevator, I flashed my high beams at the left lane squatters and my mom told me not to flash at left lane squatters. Uh, elevator fan, yeah, keep them honest. Flash your lights at them, honk your horn. Okay, Evan, uh, today is Monday. Usually do live streams on Tuesday, by the way. How many house lengths is your stopping distance on icy roads? Also, how can people get a license by just taking a test? Uh, Evan, how many house lengths? Uh, totally guessing. I know for a f I know the fact is is that it takes ten l times more distance to stop on icy roads uh, than it does on regular surfaces like asphalt, gravel, those types of things. So ice is even more slippery, and snow tires for the most part are not going to help you out uh, on ice and snow. Close, Hillerick, and all viewers from Ra. Rosenheim County, Southeast Bavaria. Hello, my friend. We are awesome, and thank you for tuning in close. I know that it's early in the morning for you, so welcome, welcome. And uh, yeah, let's get over to the presentation here, and then uh, we'll come back. Presentation is about 10 or 12 minutes, and then we come back and we spend the rest of the remainder of the hour answering any questions you have about passing a driver's test or being a safer, smarter driver. And yes, as I mentioned, uh, usually do these on Tuesday. We're doing it on Monday today because I have some stuff I can't get out of tomorrow that I need to do. So unfortunately, I can't get to the live stream tomorrow. So we're doing it today. Okay. And we're all here. All right. So talking about smarter defensive driving and space. If you want to boil down the smarter defensive driving into its core components, it's, it's just two things. All right. And those two things, those two things are space in front okay three to four second following distance and stopping in traffic so that you can see the tires in front making clear contact with the pavement that's your landmark and it's approximately one vehicle length behind the vehicle in front of you as well you need a backup okay every time you do something 
backup. So you're going to observe and your backup is communication. You're going to signal, you're going to position your vehicle correctly on the roadway. You're going to get eye contact with other road users. You're going to have hand gestures to tell them whether you, they should stay put or that they can cross or those types of things. So defensive driving, space, space management. If you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. Oh, goofy thing. There we go. There's my controls. All right, for those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, hauling freight between Ontario, Canada, and the United States. I was in most of the lower 48, except two states, I believe. I wasn't in New Mexico, and I haven't been to Utah. So two states I haven't been to. Uh, drove buses for Greyhound in the regional, one of the regional bus lines in Australia. Uh, while well, I was going to university at the University of Melbourne, uh, 2006, graduated with my doctorate in legal history, uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998. Most of my driving instruction has been with bigger vehicles, semi-trucks uh, and buses, coaches, transit buses, those types of things, and uh, air brakes, log books as well. So uh, you have to know all the lower class stuff to take a higher class license. So if you're going to get a license to drive an ambulance, to drive a bus, a small bus for charity, uh, a semi-truck, dump truck, those types of things, all of the lower class stuff is fair game. They're going to ask you class five questions. They're going to ask you right away and all of the other questions that you had to answer uh, when you got your first license. All right. Uh, my doctorate in legal history is the study of policing. Uh, legal history is the study of policing courts and prisons, and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. And if you want to know more about me, uh, you can check out the complete story over at the Smart Drive Test website. And it's kind of funny too. There's some funny stories about an Australian bloke uh, that I drove buses with, and uh, when I first got there, he trained me, and then he gave it up to go and be a postie. And I met him a few years later, and. Uh, he gets on my bus and he's like, like, oh, what happened to me in a postie? And he gets off the bus and he looks back and he smiles. He's like, oh, I gave that the ass. <laughs> so it didn't work out for him and he was back uh, driving buses. All right, uh, new videos this week. Uh, parallel parking on a one-way street. Have a look at that if you're in the bigger metropolitan cities and going to parallel park on the driver's side as well. Three tips for driving on unfamiliar roads. And those three tips would be pay attention to the road signs. If you are slowing down to look for an address or a store or a shop or something like that, turn on your four-way flashers to indicate the other traffic that you're doing something unpredictable. And if you know you're close but you just can't find the address, uh, have a look at the video on Spain when I drove from the airport to the hotel downtown. I went past the hotel. I knew I was close to the hotel. Couldn't find it. Was tired. Had just got off a 20-hour flight and parked the car and walk to the hotel, which I found out was two blocks from the car park where I was at. So if you're tired, fatigued, or you just for whatever reason cannot find the location that you're looking for, park the car and walk. All right. What is driving? Driving is both an art and a science. And the art part is your ability to interpret traffic patterns and determine the actions of individual road users. This is what is going to keep you safe. You need to have calm awareness when you're driving. And as was said here, uh, I believe it was Mr. Doverfield that said, uh, aggressive driving where you know it's calm awareness with profanity. We, we tr wanna try and not have the profanity piece. We just wanna be like, hey, oh yeah, you cut us off. Go and have your crash somewhere else. Have a nice day. All the best, bye bye. Okay, we have poor forms of communication. And one of the theories about that is the nose to tail theory or the uh, boot to bonnet, as I like to call it, where we're looking at the back end of the vehicles in front of us. And this is the reason we fail to communicate. Think of it like standing in a line at the grocery store. We're not communicating with the people in front of us because we're looking at their backside and we're not going to start chatting them up when we're looking at their backside. And it's the same thing with cars and traffic. It's nose to tail. Maybe if we had some sort of open communication that within, you know, a uh, hundred foot radius of the car cars around us, we could all communicate effectively with the drivers in those vehicles. Wouldn't that be kind of cool <laughs> if they come up with new cars where we could all talk to one another? Hey, dumbass, uh, what are you doing there? Let's go, let's go, come on, hurry up. <laughs> but you don't want to say that, so let's say code, Mr. Dumas, Mrs. Dumas, which is code for, you know. 
Anyway, rudimentary communication and also with the smarter defensive driving, as I was saying previously, you always, always want to have a backup. You want to double check. So you want to shoulder check twice before you change directions of the vehicle. And the backup that you're having is signaling when you're changing directions of the vehicle to indicate to other road users that you are in fact changing directions of the vehicle in case you missed seeing them when you were driving. All right, proactive driving. Okay, and this is without the profanity. Social driving, this is the way that everybody else drives in the driving environment in which you drive. Where it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Europe, Australia, China, uh, maybe China's a little bit different, but for the most part, uh, you know, North America, it is all the same. People follow too close, they speed, they don't come to complete stops at stop signed intersections, they drive over painted islands, they do all kinds of goofy, crazy things. And one of the reasons that I say space management, space in front is your biggest tool for driving is because the number one crashes in North America is rear end crashes. Rear end crashes. We are following too close to other traffic and hoping on a wing and a prayer that we can get our vehicle stopped in time. And we don't. Okay, speed management. Posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. I advocate that you keep up with the flow of traffic. It makes you more predictable. But space trumps speed every time. Even if you're doing 100 miles an hour, you still want to be four seconds behind the vehicle in front of you. For those of you driving on the Autobahn, like Klaus and other very fortunate people that can drive on the Autobahn, you still want that space behind other traffic on the roadway. Because as I say, if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. And as well, space buys you time, time buys you options. Options reduce the chances of being involved in a crash. Communication, we talked about this. This is the same as the skill and technique you need for getting your license. Position of your vehicle on the roadway or the position of the road user in relation to the road or on the road is going to communicate intent. For example, if you're stand, if you're in the left turning lane, there's a high probability that you're going to turn left. If the pedestrian is standing near the crosswalk, there's a high probability that he or she is going to cross the roadway. All right. Uh, Lights and signals, eye contact, hand gestures. Don't tell another road user that they're number one. All right, and then finally use of the horn. In some countries, the horn is going to be a form of communication. If you're in Italy, uh, yes, indeed. Or you're in China, yes, indeed. The horn is going to be seen as a sign of communication. Here in North America, the horn is going to be seen as a sign of aggression. All right, so that's communication, observation, forward scanning pattern, shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder checking. This is a skill that you should not lose ever, okay? It's not going to save you today, maybe not even tomorrow or next month or next year, but in five years, shoulder checking may see you finding somebody that you completely unexpected in your blind area when you're going to change directions of the vehicle. So shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. As I say, not shoulder checking is to driving what not checking to see if a weapon is loaded is to gun safety you would never pick up a gun and not check to see whether it was loaded okay and if you want, <laughs> uh, just ask alex baldwin about that always always check to see if a firearm is loaded the same thing with a motor vehicle why at any in any on any planet would you drive a 2500 pound vehicle at speed boot change directions and not check to see whether somebody was in your blind area all right, so observation, shoulder checking, uh, reversing 360 degree scan, use all your tools available. Use your backup camera, use your mirrors, look out the back windows. All of this is going to keep you safe when you're driving. Minimum safe distance and you can always manage space in front of your vehicle. Everything else is beyond your control. The other three sides, okay? And most defensive driving models were created prior to 1970 when traffic was pretty light on our roadways. Now we need different tactics, techniques, and skills to keep ourselves safe on the roadways, okay? Stay away from other road users, other fixed objects. A fixed object is light standards, anything that doesn't move on the roadways that you could potentially run into and strike, okay? And to repeat again, space buys you time, time buys you options, Options prevent crashes and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in one. 
When on highways, freeways, and interstates, drive between the clusters of vehicles. For whatever reason, there is some magical force out there on the highways that causes groups of drivers to drive up and down our roadways. And you can see the cluster here in this image off to the right here. All of the vehicles are just grouped right up together. And there's a vehicle out there and a vehicle out there. And there's all this space here where you could drive in and be much, much safer. Okay? Speed management will allow you to control space and always have a buffer of space between you and other road users. All right, rear end crashes. Uh, this is stopping behind other traffic, one vehicle length, and you're gonna have, be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the roadway. That is your landmark. And there are several reasons why you wanna do this. Once it's a defensive posturing against being rear-ended by other traffic, uh, if you, change your mind where you're gonna go and you wanna go somewhere else, you can move out and around without reversing because you do not wanna reverse in traffic. That is just a no-no, that is a golden rule. All right, uh, if the vehicle in front of you rolls backwards, if it's a manual transmission for all of you driving in Europe, then this vehicle in front of you is not gonna strike you. And in some magical utopian world of which I dream at nights when I'm under the covers dreaming of popsicles and other tasty treats, uh, you could all the traffic could move off together and this would actually help to reduce congestion in our roadways. But this is not gonna happen, okay? People are gonna pack up their tight bumper to bumper, one foot off the bumper in front, but that is not your best defensive strategy. All right, if you're following too close, you are giving up your power. You are giving it to the other person in front of you and you're hoping on a wing and a prayer that you can react fast enough that you don't rear end the person. Statistics say otherwise. You cannot react fast enough. So you wanna create that space in front of your vehicle so that you respond accordingly because space gives you time, time gives you options, and you want to respond with different choices, okay? And if we have predictable actions according to the road rules and cultures of our roadways, we are going to be less likely to be involved in a crash, okay? Predict traffic patterns, and this again is another tool, another uh, result of having space in front of our vehicles because we can predict traffic patterns and interpret the actions of individual road users. Turning lanes, you need to be in the outside turning lane, looking for rubberneckers and anything out of the ordinary. One of the things that you can know for certain in terms of traffic patterns, if there is an emergency vehicle pulled over on the side of the road, whether a police officer has a speeder pulled over or there is a crash and emergency crews are responding, traffic is going to slow down because everybody is rubbernecking and wants to see what's going on, okay? Know the characteristics of other vehicles and road users. In the spring, it's gonna be motorcycles. In the summer, it's gonna be RVs and camper units. And in the wintertime, it's going to be snowmobiles. And then of course, if you're in the country, it's gonna be farm machinery. If you're in an industrial area, it's going to be forklifts and other types of industrial machinery out on the roadways. So think about your driving environments. And we talked about this last week in terms of situational awareness. Interpret the actions of individual road users by looking farther down the road, interpreting vehicles' movements, paying attention to your driving and maintaining a space, the space buffer, that space in front of your vehicle. The reason we wanna do that is because defensive driving just isn't to compensate for the other goofy people on the road. We too make mistakes when we're driving and defensive driving is for us to put in place habits and develop habits that are going to keep us safe even when we're tired. Mapping and tracking intersections, uh, mapping intersections and tracking road users at those intersections. 40% of crashes occur at intersections. Where are the intersections? Who is going to cross our path of travels? And scan intersections before entering because that opening statistic 40% of crashes happen at intersections. All right, good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All right, Marion here is here. Hello, Marion, how are you, my friend? Uh, antics, I passed my driver's test today. Congratulations on passing your driver's test today. That is awesome, my friend. Thank you for stopping back and letting us know that you were successful on your driver's test. Uh, Lorena aiming to pass my road test by the help of your helpful guides and tips. Uh, avid viewer here in Regina, Saskatchewan. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Lorena, for your kind words. And you're going to do it. You're going to get your license, my friend. 
Uh, Ross, and I still watch your videos and I will always drive like a normal driver. <laughs> Not sure there's such a thing as a normal driver. <laughs> smarter driver. Drive like a smarter driver, Ross, and you're going to do awesome, my friend. I uh, failed my first driver's test here in Regina last Friday and I have my second road test scheduled for the 19th of January, hoping it will be my last driver's test. Uh, excellent, yes. And Lorena, Corey will put up the video for you on passing your driver's test in the wintertime, why it's going to be easier. So don't get freaked out just because there's a bit of snow on the road. It's actually going to make it easier for you and help you out. Marion, uh, being late, uh, last 30 minutes on call to a company. <laughs> <coughs> I feel you. I feel you, Marion. Uh, there's nothing I love more than knowing I have to call TELUS. Uh, I know that it's going to be at least two hours. Any big company, you get stuck in that phone tree. Uh, you keep punching the numbers, hoping for some human person to talk to you on the other end. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Queen K, uh, thanks for all your teaching. I passed my driver's test yesterday after three tries in Massachusetts. Awesome, Queen K. Congratulations on passing your driver's test there in Massachusetts, that is awesome, my friend. Uh, Elevator, do you teach your students to flash their high beams and honk their horns at left lane squatters? Uh, Elevator fan, I do not. <laughs> if we were doing remedial training after they had their license and they already had their license and didn't have to do a test, yes, uh, maybe, <laughs> but not as a rule. No, that's generally something I do when I'm driving a sports car like uh, the Audi of Tracy's Audi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marion, I'm doing well. Thank you. You are most welcome. I am awesome, awesome, awesome on a Monday. Uh, it's been busy, busy, busy. Uh, Tracy's dad died on the weekend, and so she went to Calgary, and <laughs> she had she was moving uh, from a one-bedroom apartment to a two-bedroom apartment in the same building, and so I have been doing that this weekend, and actually that's what we're going to finish up tomorrow. And that's why I can't be here for the live stream tomorrow. That's why it's on Monday instead of Tuesday. So, yes, doing really, really well. Uh, endless music over and over again. Yes, um, and it's it's not music, Marion, is it? It's that Muzak. Or, or did they play a radio station for you? Uh, I love it when you get that Muzak, that elevator music that you're playing when you're listening on hold. It's almost like, ah, we got you on hold. You, you can't do anything. You're just stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so demoralizing. Uh, Rawson, hey, question. Can you accidentally stall an automatic transmission? Uh, Rawson, uh, can you automatically... You, you would need to work pretty hard at that. Uh, actually, yeah. Yeah, you would... Uh, I don't think you can. But, you know, I caveat to that... Students can amaze you in some of the things that they can do with an automobile or with a truck or anything else. Uh, yeah, there are, I, I'm not going to say no, but not as a rule <laughs> are you going to be able to stall an automatic car. No. Uh, Klaus, what are your tips for driving in India? That's a serious question. Yeah, um, Klaus, I can't really, I can't comment on that authoritatively because I haven't been to India. I have been to China. And I have to say, it's just a matter of doing what they do, okay? You can try and manage that space in front of your vehicle, but, you know, there is just so much traffic. There are so many vehicles on the roadway and so many different kinds of vehicles. India, I am guessing, is similar to China when I was there in Beijing uh, late early 2000s I was in China and they still have oxen and cart going up and down the roadways. They still have horse and buggy. They still have horse riders. Uh, not to mention all of the other, you know, the tricycle, the motorized sized tricycles, the bicycles, the tricycles, everything going up and down the roadway. So it's going to be really tough to drive on those streets. You're just going to have to do what other people do. Make sure you have insurance on the vehicle if you're renting a vehicle. Okay. <clears throat> Awesome. Uh, nope, it's the music. Muzak, and it is slightly out of tune as well, which makes it worse. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Uh, yep, over and over. Excellent. Okay. Uh, elevator, do you teach your student? Okay, nope, I already answered that question. Uh, passed my road test yesterday after three tries. Awesome. Congratulations. All right. Uh, Oh, Rawson, what is the buggy? The buggy is my 1998 Honda CRV. 
sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I need to keep saying that, uh, that it is my Honda 1998 Honda CRV, which is in the shop yet again, and I hope that they get it fixed because I'm getting really annoyed with the buggy <laughs> in and out of the shop. All right, okay. So, defensive driving, space in front of your vehicle, that is the most important part of keeping yourself safe on the roadways, and other traffic is not doing that, you have social pressure, okay? Within the arena of social driving, social pressure is real. And that social pressure when you're driving, especially for new drivers who are susceptible to that, are always saying, oh, hurry up and go, hurry up and go, hurry up and go, hurry up and go. I don't wanna get in the way of other people and have them honking horns at me and telling me I'm number one, okay? So this causes us to conform to the way that everybody else is driving. And we think, and we're led to believe by the tenets of social driving, that if we leave space in front of our vehicle that other people are gonna honk at us. We believe that if we manage that three to four second following distance, that all your friends who participate in social driving, like 12 cars are gonna all of a sudden come and they're gonna move in front of that space in front of you. All of that is a myth and a misbelief. It's not true. I drive like that every day. I stop back one vehicle length from the traffic in front of me when I'm stopped in traffic, and I always have a three to four second following distance in front of me. I will not, will not give up that space in front of my vehicle. And this is, it doesn't matter what kind of traffic I'm in, whether I'm on the highway, I'm in congested traffic, uh, you know, and I tried this out, and unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't catch it on my dash cam, I was hoping to, I was in backed up traffic for an hour in Vancouver and I tried that, keeping that kind of 10 car lengths between me and the car in front of me so that I could just stay in first gear and just chug along in the congestion. In the hour, two vehicles moved in front of me. Two vehicles, okay? So know that it can be done. I know that it goes against everything else that the driving environment is telling you. And if there's one thing that we need as human beings, we need to fit in. We need to fit in. We need to conform and be what, do what everybody else is doing. But defensive driving, smarter defensive driving, is you doing something different than what everybody else is doing because that way it's going to keep you safe and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash on our roadways. And I have tried this smarter driving skills, abilities, and techniques all over the world, North America, Europe, Australia, okay? I have driven in all these countries and it works, okay? And it will keep you safe. Cario, hello, my friend. It is important to leave even more space than one normally leaves in front of one's vehicle if you have a gator behind you. A tailgater, yes, a tailgater behind you. It was the gator. I'm like, what, like an alligator? A tailgater, yes, indeed, because now you need to drive for yourself, you need to drive your car, and you need to drive the car for the goofball behind you as well. Yes, indeed, okay? Uh, Marion, that's exactly what I am finding here at the moment. I feel I need to move so people don't get mad at me. I do sometimes feel lots of pressure while out there on the roads. And yes, Marion, that's going to, that's going to happen. You're going to feel like other people are like, they're glazing at you, oh, you evil driver. Conform, conform. That's what they're saying to you. And we feel it. We feel it. We feel the pressure. With all those people looking at you, going, conform. <coughs> do what we do. Okay? <laughs> and they're not. They couldn't give a rat's bum what you're doing. They really couldn't. A uh, hater, uh, how do you trade lanes, change lanes strafely and highway when people uh, trying to exit and people trying to merge? Okay, hater, those uh, those don't exist anymore. There are a few of them. And I don't know what the names are, they are where the on-ramp and the exit lane are the same, one and the same. Okay, Th those are dangerous and they've gotten rid of them because they've caused a lot of crashes. So know that, that they've gotten rid of those, all right? Okay, but again, it's about managing space. It's about observing correctly. It's about interpreting traffic patterns and understanding the individual actions of road users on the roadway and having a backup, shoulder checking, shoulder checking, moving your head, okay? You cannot 
be static in the car. You can't be sitting there like this. You got to be moving your head, moving your head. And sometimes because you've got the A pillar here at the front and the other one on the passenger side, sometimes you got to be moving forward. You got to be moving back. You got to be looking around the mirror because there are blind areas in the vehicle. So know that when you're driving, you're moving your body. It's a full body experience, all right? And where all of this came from is my years of driving tractor trailer, okay? The bigger the vehicle, the more critical space becomes when you're driving because we wanna be lazy truck drivers. Think of it as being a lazy truck driver. We're doing the lazy truck driver defensive driving move space in front so we can keep the vehicle moving. All right, you wanna control that space in front of your vehicle using the accelerator, not the brake. If you're on the brake all the time, you are too close to the cars in front of you. There's an indicator right there. Just start thinking and being aware of how much you're touching the brake pedal. If you're touching the brake pedal going downhill on a highway, you're probably too close to the traffic in front of you. Okay, you shouldn't be touching the brake. You should be anticipating traffic, understanding traffic patterns, and being able to use the throttle, using the accelerator to control space in front of your vehicle. If you can do that, again, that is another piece, another detail in the puzzle of defensive driving that is going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Uh, Hater, there's some of them in your area where you live. Yes, there are a few of them left around. But as I said, they're getting rid of them as they're uh, reconstructing the roads because they know that they're not safe. There's just simply too much going on uh, when you're driving, uh, when the on-ramp and the off-ramp are one and the same. But again, you gotta keep in mind, <laughs> you know, you gotta be aware, you gotta be scanning, shoulder checking, looking, picking your spot. So if you're gonna merge out onto the highway and this is one of the most, frequently asked questions that I get is, is how do I merge out onto the roadway if nobody's gonna let me in people don't have to let you in okay they are under no obligation to let you out on the highway the onus of responsibility of merging safely out onto the freeway is on the merging driver so when you're coming out on the on-ramp and you can see the highway you can see the lane of traffic where you're gonna be merging into pick your spot okay there's a red car and a blue car and I'm gonna merge in between those two cars. If you have a spot to aim for, it's going to be easier to get your vehicle up to speed so you can move into that spot. So pick your spot early and merge into that spot. If there's a semi truck out on the roadway, merge behind the semi truck. Don't try and race the semi truck, okay? Merge in behind it, that's a lot safer and then get out around the semi truck and take off, all right? Uh, Carry O, if an intersection, someone honks at you and you know it is not safe to go, it's important to ignore the honker and only go when they know it is safe to go. Yes, absolutely, because the onus of safety is on you, not the person who's honking. Tell, Just give them the finger and tell them to go and pound salt, as my mom likes to say. I'm not sure how you go and pound salt, but you can tell them to go and do that. Uh, problems too, if I don't move fast enough, I get honked at. It has happened a few times. Yeah, just ignore people uh, who are honking at you because... You know, they're going to do it anyway. Wait, they're going to do it regardless, um, you know, because they got nothing better to do and they need to get their frustration out. And uh, so that's what they do. Uh, Ross and his shoulder checking and blind spot check the same thing because I call it blind spot check. Uh, Ross and yes, they are the same thing, my friend. Thank you for asking that. Blind spot checking your blind spots and shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder there. Check my shoulder, check my shoulder. Yes, those are one and the same thing, my friend. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Uh, elevator fan, if I had a truck speed up while I was trying to pass, uh, if someone else is passing you, do not increase your speed. Yes, okay, and actually, uh, you know, you can just let off the accelerator a little bit and slow down and let the truck pass you so that they can get back in. Uh, Corey, in Winnipeg, we have them acceleration and deceleration combos on their perimeter intersection bridges. Yeah, I'm not sure, Corey, why they do that anymore. We have, know that these things aren't safe. They confuse drivers. Uh, there's simply too much going on on acceleration uh, uh, on ramps and ex uh, exit ramps one in the same thing I know there's a name for them I've seen them in the handbooks before and I've been on them and they they are they're a bit tricky for sure especially for new drivers I can't imagine 
Uh, new drivers having trouble merging. Yes, challenging for sure. Uh, Hater, let's say the middle lane is empty. You in the right most lane. There's another car in the most left lane. Both of you decided to change lanes in the middle. How to how to avoid something like that? Shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder checking, Hayden. So you're going to shoulder check. You know there's another car over there. Okay, you're in the right-hand lane. The car's in the left-hand lane. And the, the middle lane is empty. You're going to put your signal on. Signal's on this side, not on that side of the steering wheel. It's on this side of the steering wheel. Okay, shoulder check, check your mirrors, look forward again. Three flashes minimum on the signal. You're gonna shoulder check again as you're moving and you're gonna shoulder check, okay? And you see that other vehicle starting to come over, then you're gonna abort, okay? One of you is gonna abort, one of you is gonna, you're gonna give it up. Now, saying that, and this comes back to defensive driving skills, abilities, and techniques, and this is an advanced information, all right? If you have the choice in a crash, crash is imminent, and you have a choice between a head-on crash and a sideswipe crash, pick the sideswipe crash every time. Sideswipe crashes almost always result in property damage. Just damage to the vehicles, okay? You are going to survive a sideswipe crash. You are not going to survive a head-on crash and there's an article down in the description have a look down in the description there uh, why you should be more afraid of driving which is an article uh, I think it's in the Atlantic Post and uh, it was a journalist who was involved in a crash and swerved to miss somebody who pulled out from a side street and instead of sideswiping the car that pulled out because he could have sideswiped this car he swerved into oncoming traffic, hit a big jacked up 350 Chevy, and the jacked up 350 Chevy come up over the hood and basically crushed the dash onto his legs. And he spent months and months and months convalescing and learning how to walk again. Had he just sideswiped the car that came out of the side street, uh, it would have been just property damage and he probably would not have been injured. So this is another piece of the <clears throat> smarter defensive driving model. Always pick the sideswipe crash because you're going to survive the sideswipe crash. Uh, Corey, uh, yeah, the usual rule of thumb on combo, the one decelerating tries to get behind the one that's accelerating. Yes, and that is a good rule of thumb because the cars are coming out, they're accelerating, they're taking off. You want to get off the throttle, get in behind them, and then go into the deceleration lane and in and exit off onto the roadway. Okay, so Corey's put up the video on how to correctly merge onto the highway. Uh, Ross and some people don't check their blind spots. Yes, actually, Rawson, if you want to know the truth, most people don't shoulder check. <laughs> and contrary to what they tell you on the polls, on the community tab here on the Smart Drive Test website, or on the YouTube channel, rather, uh, they don't. Okay, if 60% of people tell you that they shoulder check, they don't. Uh, I would guess that the number for shoulder checking is probably below 20%. That would be my professional opinion about people shoulder checking. Uh, Cario, thanks for this awesome live stream on defensive driving. Got to go to meet some friends, but wanted to say thank you. Cario, you are most welcome, my friend. Thank you for dropping in and being part of the Smarter Driver community. All the best, my friend. Uh, Marion, there's one of those intersections in Vancouver. It is very short on-ramp, off-ramp, and it's just after a corner as well, so stick to the left lane to pass the off-ramp. Yes, uh, goofy things, goofy things. They're an invention left over from the 1950s, 1960s, uh, when traffic was not as heavy as it is now, and uh, you know they worked well at the time when you didn't have as much traffic because the chances of three cars coming onto the highway and three cars getting off at the same time was nil to none. Okay, it rarely happened. There might have been one or two cars at the same time. But now we have so much traffic that these, this type of road infrastructure simply doesn't work. Uh, <clears throat> weird, but some other drivers are like Elon Musk, just ignorant. Uh, yes, um... <laughs> I don't like to speak ill of people, but I used to think to myself that Elon Musk must be really smart. He's got lots of money. He's got a rocket ship company. He started Tesla and whatnot and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, you know, the more that I go on, it's like, oh, now he's bought Twitter. Uh, you know, formerly Twitter. <laughs> 
The X thing did not catch on. I'm sorry to say, the X thing has not caught on. I don't call it, I don't, it's formerly Twitter. It's now, it's now like Prince. The artist once formerly known as Prince. Uh, the social media platform once known as Twitter is what it is. Formerly Twitter. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't work out at all for him. That just is not caught on. And people don't say X. They're like formerly Twitter. It's Twitter. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I digress. I digress. Moving on, defensive driving. We're talking about defensive driving today. Now, the other piece uh, about defensive driving and speeding is is that uh, people believe that obeying traffic laws will keep you safe. Okay, obeying traffic laws will not keep you safe. Okay, I will say that unequivocally. Okay. Traffic laws no more prevent crashes than criminal law prevents crime. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So if you think that you're going to go out there and you're going to drive and you're going to do everything according to the law, it's not going to keep you safe. It's not going to make you a safer driver. Okay? So keep up with traffic flow. Be a predictable driver. What can I say about defensive driving? Okay, there, are, Gustav, two things that you need to do to be a safer, smarter driver and to be a better defensive driver. Space in front, three to four second following distance. You should be controlling space in front of your vehicle with the accelerator. Not all the time, obviously, but as much as you can. 80% of the time, you should be controlling space in front of your vehicle using the accelerator, okay? So you're reading and interpreting traffic patterns in front and you're adjusting your speed accordingly with the accelerator. If you are too close, and on the brake all the time, you are not reading and responding to traffic patterns in front of you. You are reacting and you're following too close. And the number one crash in North America, and I suspect most of the world, is rear end crashes. Number one insurance reported crash is rear end crashes, even more so than windshield damage. So, <laughs> okay, know that. Increase your following distance, stop in traffic one vehicle length back from the vehicle in front of you, and your landmark for that is to be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the pavement. This works for every vehicle, cars, buses, trucks. We used to teach it in the semi-truck. It works for every vehicle, and there's several reasons why you can do that. But if you can put those two simple skills in place, it's going to improve your overall driving, okay? Uh, Ross and I do get a good habit of applying the parking brake in an automatic. I know most people don't, but it's a great habit. Uh, do it to secure the vehicle and it won't, yeah, and it won't run away. It'll still be there when you get back. Absolutely, okay? So apply the parking brake every time you park the vehicle, not just in a manual car, but also in an automatic car, okay? And people say to me, well, that's what parks for in the, in the transmission. No, it's not. The brakes are designed to hold the car. And this is why in new cars, the parking brake applies automatically when you put the car, the car, the transmission into park because the brakes are designed to hold the vehicle, not the transmission. The transmission is a backup. We want a backup in our driving. This is why we use uh, observation and communication in tandem. Okay, We looked around, we observed, but then we turned on our signal to communicate to other traffic just in case we missed somebody. Okay, So we want to have a backup. That's why we shoulder check twice. That's why before we pull out into busy traffic from a minor road onto a major road, we're going to look twice, okay? We're going to make sure. If we're making a left-hand turn uh, from a side street out onto another road, just before we cross that center line, we're looking again to make sure that there isn't traffic coming that we missed. So we have a backup. So space in front, stopping in traffic one vehicle length back, and having a backup when you're driving is going to make you a safer, smarter driver. Klaus, uh, Tesla is a car you can buy if you have a million dollars or euros because it has so many issues with the electric and suspension systems. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, the kid's mother had a Tesla and the steering, was it the steering? Yes, the steering pump went out of it. Uh, they put it on a diesel truck. They shipped it five hours to Vancouver. They fixed it. They put it back on a diesel truck. 
and they shipped it another five hours back to Kelowna to have it repaired. And uh, they just basically couldn't get their car repaired here where we live in the interior of British Columbia. Uh, it had to be shipped to the coast to Vancouver to have it repaired. Uh, Rawson, okay, awesome, excellent. And yes, and if, if we're all complaining about inflation, talking about cars, uh, Tracy just recently came back from Italy, and in Italy, a Volkswagen Golf was 65,000 euros, which is $100,000 Canadian. So that would be 60, 65,000 dollars. 65,000 euros would be about 80,000 dollars US. So we're not the only ones dealing with inflation and inflation in Europe is actually even more so than it is here uh, in North America. Uh, Mary and I love watching traffic ahead of me. If traffic is stopping ahead, you see their brake lights coming down in the line. I take my foot off the pedal and by the time I need to stop, I'm almost stopped. Excellent. Yes, Marion. And the other piece about that, Marion, and the advanced skill about that is you see the brake lights coming on as they're slowing down. Also, the other thing is, is they start all the traffic, all the vehicles bunch up. That's the other uh, indicator in tandem <clears throat> with brake lights coming on is the spaces between the vehicles actually get smaller as they slow down. Uh, Ross and have you thought about getting a new vehicle? Uh, Ross and yes, I have thought about getting a new vehicle, but the engine and the buggy just keeps going. Everything around the engine <laughs> is falling off of it, but the engine keeps going. Uh, elevator, I was tailgated today and I got uh, frustrated with them. I did a quick tap on the brake. Uh, yeah, and a lot of times that will get their attention and they will usually back off again. I find um, I don't get tailgated a lot when I'm driving, but I do find that what will happen is, is that people will come up and they'll be right in behind you and you look in the mirror and they're like, you can't see their headlights, they're so close behind you. And then, you know, you're driving with the traffic flow, so you're in a 30 mile an hour zone and you're doing 35 or 37 miles an hour. And then you look and you, they've backed off, okay? Because they're not tailgating anymore. So I find that a lot of times when I'm driving and I'm being predictable and I'm keeping up with traffic flow, that's what's happening uh, that they just they kind of come up misjudge the space and then they back off and they regain that space afterwards <laughs> electric cars uh, are should be the future not so fast yeah electric cars Klaus we are not ready for electric cars and it, it's interesting uh, I was talking to somebody about it the other day in terms of you know right now on YouTube and the internet and everybody's talking about AI. AI is the big fad right now. It's like oh my god you got to get on board with AI and have this and do this and look at these tools and this and that and blah blah blah. AI on the internet right now is what electric cars were in 2018. Okay, everybody was like, oh my God, electric cars, electric cars, electric cars. They're going to fix the future. They're going to be the, the next wave of the next revolution. It's like, no, electric cars are gone. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> people are still going to buy them and those types of things. But really, hybrids are the way to go because they, they work together in tandem. You get your regen braking. Uh, you get, uh, you know, you can work on fuel, you can work on electricity, and the two of them work really well. And I mean, the Prius has proved that. I mean, the Prius has been around forever, and taxi cabs and whatnot. Yes, hybrids, right? And I, there is a place for this, but we can, we're not ready for fully electric. We just do not have the battery technology uh, in place yet. And they just, they got a little ahead of themselves uh, with electric cars. And unfortunately, what's happened is they've made people who were advocates of the electric car move against them, right? It kind of backfired because now a whole group of people that would have supported the move towards electricity and electric cars and alternative fuel sources are now like, oh yeah, that doesn't work at all. So this is what's happening. And the other thing is, is that what we need to do is we need to promote choice, right? Uh, unfortunately, Public transport, tra public transportation does not work in low density uh, populations. Where I live, for example, you cannot get around here without a car. You have to have a car. The public transit is terrible. Okay, you have to have high density cities: New York City, Chicago, uh, you know, Stuttgart, Germany, uh, you know, Paris. 
all these places in Europe, they trains work, public transit works because you have a high density population. And when you have a high density population, public transit works. When I lived in Melbourne, Australia, for example, for five years, I never owned a car. If I needed a car, I went and hired a car. Uh, I rode my bicycle. I took public transit because I never looked at a transit schedule the entire time I was in Melbourne because you would just walk down to get on the tram and a tram came every eight minutes. So why would you why would you need a car? You take rail or whatnot, right? Just hire a car whenever you needed to go out of town and those types of things. So we need to promote choice. We need to get people with choice, right? And we need and in North America, they need to learn how to build bike paths because the you know their bike paths are terrible. I would most of them I wouldn't even ride on. Uh, Staby, good evening. Uh, why do other road users get angry when you're driving defensively in St. John, New Brunswick? There are so many people driving that are quite crazy. Uh, Staby, it's not just uh, St. John's. Or St. John, rather, you're in New Brunswick. My apologies. It's St. John. Uh, not just St. John, my friend. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Everybody is engaging in social driving. So it's not just you, my friend. Uh Marion, the electric car battery is more expensive than the car. It's crazy. Yes, indeed. Uh, Klaus, buy another Honda CRV and put the engine from the CRV in the other Honda CRV. Yes, I was thinking that the other day that I needed a Honda CRV sitting in my backyard for parts. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's not attractive. That's not attractive. Uh, Corey, there are uh, perhaps still the car of the future, just a far more distant future than initially advertised, it seems. Yes. And. Uh, there's, there's a video here on the channel. I talked about self-driving cars because I think it was 2017 that Elon Musk said that by 2020, uh, we would all be driving around in self-driving cars. Well, that hasn't come to fruition either. And it's uh, self-driving cars is a little bit like AI. Uh, it is not as advanced as people think it is. Okay. And I tried AI when it first came out to generate uh, multiple choice questions uh, for the uh, different states uh, for the learner's permit. And they were rudimentary, at, to say the least. And most of them, I uh, you know, I had fact checked quite a number of them. They weren't they weren't even reliable in terms of the facts that they were putting forward or the information that they were putting forward for the different states in Ohio's and those type you know the state of Ohio for example. Uh, you know, they it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't, we couldn't even rely on the facts, the, the, the multiple choice questions they were generating. Uh, Stabie, what's the difference between an CVT transmission engine? Uh, I would need to look into that for you, Stabie, in terms of a CVT transmission. I just don't know enough about it to be able to tell you that. I know that most transmissions, automatic transmissions, are hydraulic. So maybe somebody else, one of the other smart drivers, could tell us what a CVT transmission is. Uh, but uh, let me look into that. Send me a an email, Staby, uh, rick at smartdrivetest.com, and I will look that up for you and let you know what the difference is those different kinds of transmissions and whether they're reliable or not. Uh, Wilson, how do you drive safely on snowy roads as, uh, while applying brakes most of the time? The vehicle slips. Okay, so Wilson, uh, I suspect you're driving an automatic transmission. One of the things you want to do in an automatic transmission when you're driving on slippery conditions ice and snow is you want to pop the transmission into neutral and if you have a column shift you just push the column shifter into neutral it will only it will stop at neutral it will not go into reverse okay and that disconnects the drivetrain from the engine and you don't have residual power pushing you forward and that way you can just use the brakes if the vehicle starts to slide release the brakes allow the tires to spin to turn, not spin, turn, and then reapply the brakes again, okay? And that's how you're going to keep maximum control of your vehicle when you're trying to bring it to a stop, okay? Do not gear down. Contrary to what everybody else says, not everybody else, but a, a, a few people who, every time I tell them this, have a go at me. You can gear down, blah, 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 blah. Well, if they're telling you not to use cruise control on slippery conditions because you could potentially lose control of your vehicle, why would you gear down? It's the same thing as using cruise control, okay? So don't gear down, just use your brakes. Push the transmission into neutral. And this is why 
those of us who drive manual cars find it easier to maintain control of the vehicle in the winter time uh, is because when you start to brake and you push in the clutch, you completely disconnect the drivetrain from the engine so you don't have any residual power pushing you forward when you're trying to brake. Uh, Wyatt, when the stop sign is before a stop line, do you stop at the sign or the line? Hope that makes sense. Yes, it does, Wyatt. Always stop behind the stop line. Doesn't matter where the, so the sign is. Uh, makes It's behind the stop line, behind the crosswalk or sidewalk. If those two conditions don't exist, then at the edge of the road just before entering the intersection. Those are your three stopping positions at stop signs and other controlled intersections, all right? And Corey will put up the video for you on that. Awesome live stream, my friends. Smart drivers, uh, if you know the answer for IVT and CBT transmissions, let us know down in the comments. Uh, hit that thumbs up button. Uh, if you wanna become part of the Smarter Driver community, uh, subscribe to the channel, definitely. Check out Past Your Driver's Test first time course package over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, on sale this week for $37, $38 US. And we throw in both the winter and defensive driving smart courses as a bonus. Congratulations to all of you who passed the driver's test in the last couple of weeks. Awesome, awesome. You know, test coming up in the next week or so. Good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.